These are killers. These are terrorists. They know no countries. He knowingly joined uh, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. I don't have any sympathy for any Australian who's done that. They are bad guys. These are the worst of the worst. And if let out on the street, they will go back to the proclivity of trying to kill Americans and others. I ended up being classed as one of the most top ten dangerous people in the world at five foot two. You know, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous, but it's been put out there so many times that there's some people that actually think I'm some type of dangerous character. It's early December 2001, three months after the 9-11 terror attacks on America. David Hicks is in Afghanistan, fleeing the battlefield. Having been with Taliban forces, he's become an enemy of the US. Ahead, the young Australian will be arrested and begin what he describes as six years of hell. To some he is seen as a traitor. For others, what was done to him in the name of justice overshadows everything. Tonight he talks for the first time about his journey to international controversy. David Hicks was brought up here in the northern suburbs of Adelaide, a tough part of town that turned out factory workers and hard rock bands. Their most famous son, the blue collar hero, Jimmy Barnes. This is the way it's gonna be forever now. It was an unlikely springboard for a life that would end up occupying the minds of a prime minister and a president. As a child, David was more into the nature side of things. He was just a normal kid at that point in time growing up. He's always been a creative writer. He wrote a story in the primary school days, plenty of characters. As far as military sides go, no, he was never interested in guns or anything like that. I was brought up without a religion. My family, we never went to church. Uh, even, even Christmas and Easter wasn't really a big event to be celebrated in our home. By the time he was nine, David Hicks's parents separated, crushing his sense of belonging. At, at times I was a boastful young man and exaggerate and get into city trouble. So this stems back to something in my childhood where I'm jumping up and down yelling out, me, me, to my you know, mother and father, my father's new family. He married into a, you know, his new wife had two sons and everything was about everyone except me. So back then there was exaggeration in trying to get attention. The trouble at home led to trouble at school. He was put into a class for boys at risk, but left at 14, failing to complete year nine. When David was a teenager, those drugs were very heavily in use. He did get caught up in that situation. Um, he tried all that, so um, it was, and it was difficult for us as well. David was virtually living off the streets and all this sort of thing, and you didn't know where he was. Yeah, it was pretty worrying. Eventually, he got back on track. He did a welding course, made him proud of what he was doing and what he was making, that sort of thing. While still in his mid-teens, David Hicks then headed to the Northern Territory and Queensland as a jackaroo and stockman. 
But by 17, he was back in Adelaide, working as a factory butcher and in a relationship with a local girl, Jodie Sparrow. She was a nice girl. And then they started a family. They had two, two, two children. And uh, well, that was what he ever thought of, was just looking after the kids and the family. He was a real family orientated man. His friend, Carl Cripps, recalls that David Hicks was devastated when the relationship with Jodie fell apart. I think over a period of time, Jodie just grew away from David. He was pretty sad about it all because he got separated from his children, which he loved dearly. He'd have a bit of a cry from time to time. Yeah, yeah, pulled him apart. So I was feeling a bit lost and trying to find my place in the world. And then thankfully I found a job in Japan. So I travelled to Japan where I uh, pre-trained racehorses. Going to Japan was like a breath of fresh air. It was the first time I travelled overseas and being surrounded by a foreign language and it made me realise there, there was more to life, the life that I'd been living previously. I realised that I wanted to travel and see more of the world and I decided that I would ride the old Silk Road by horse. So I started reading a lot of books on all those countries I would pass through and that's when I first came across uh, Islam. The Western world with its technology against the Islamic world with its mythology. On my time off work on weekends, I used to walk up into these big uh, snow-clad mountains. It was just beautiful and I'd go up there and I'd write poetry. Muhammad's food, you shall be fed. To disagree, so off with your head. Did you have any deep understanding of Islam when you wrote that poem? No, none whatsoever. And I'd not even met a Muslim at that point in my life. As Serb forces bombarded Kosovo Liberation Army strongholds in the hills, we witnessed scenes of wanton destruction. Whether or not David Hicks was undergoing a spiritual awakening, he was certainly becoming more politically aware. After watching TV coverage of the fighting in Kosovo, he suddenly shelved his Silk Road dreams. The village was razed before our eyes. The Serbian military were indiscriminate. They were killing and, and torturing and, and, and murdering and doing horrible things. And there was something inside of me that was stirred by that. Uh, we have to recognise that we are on the brink of a major humanitarian disaster. A NATO spokesman called Jamie Shea was giving the briefings to the media every day. And I interpreted his words, his daily briefings, uh, for anyone that thought they had the capabilities or wanted to help, that they could travel to Albania and join the Kosovo Liberation Army and help this one million refugees and to stop the genocide that was occurring there. David um, rang us and said, um, I'm going to join the KLA. And I said, oh, working for an airline now, that's great. <laughs> he said, no, no, the Kosovo, Kosovo Liberation Army. And I went, oh, yeah, right, I... These are the first pictures ever taken of their training camp. Today, like every day, they have a stream of new recruits. David Hicks was in Albania for only a few weeks, in May and June of 1999. Here they are staying on a war footing. I attended a, uh, two training camps, Kosovo Liberation training camps at the time, and did basic military training. It was a life-changing experience. 64 of the refugees were slaughtered, say the KLA. Young and old alike perished here. I listened to people with tears telling me about their, watching their sisters being raped and killed and all the most terrible, disgusting things. So I had this massive impact on me uh, hearing all of this. And I just felt this emotional attachment to the people and to what they were suffering and what they were going through. And, you know, I so much wanted to help. They were greeted as liberators. He didn't get the opportunity. The Kosovo conflict ended while he was still in a training camp. I personally didn't actually step foot into Kosovo. There has been a lot of misconceptions about me from day one. There's one particular photo of me that has been used a lot in the media. That photo was a silly boy's trophy shot of empty weapons taken from a storeroom 
in Albania while I was with the Kosovo Liberation Army in a training camp within Albania. It, it was used to portray a negative image on me uh, and uh, an image that was not correct. But the Kosovo experience seemed to feed David Hicks's need to belong to something. On his return, he wore his KLA uniform through Adelaide Airport. I think he was, at that point in time, he was probably feeling pretty good about himself, that, you know, he'd been and done something, um, whatever, um, and he's proud of being part of that in helping other people. Ready to pursue a real military career, David Hicks tried to sign up at home. I inquired about joining the Australian Army, thinking I could use that as a means to continue helping people, but they wouldn't accept me because I was a high school dropout, hadn't completed Year 10, so they weren't even interested in interviewing me. I was a little disappointed, not hugely. I think I was more surprised than uh, disappointed to be rejected. I've never really pondered that, that, that crossroad in my life. There's so many of them, but yeah, it definitely would have taken me down a different path. So I ended up working as a chicken deboner at a local shopping centre. I once again felt lost and was looking for my place in the world. My head was just swirling of all these political type questions, such as like Kosovo. Uh, but there was no one I could go to. I didn't have a mentor. There was no one I knew that was politically aware. And I thought, well, I did plan to ride the Silk Road. And then I remembered Islam and, and Muslims. So I thought I should try and find an actual Muslim and meet a Muslim for the first time and present all my questions to them to see if they could answer those questions. Some critics have suggested David Hicks's conversion to Islam may have begun earlier, perhaps through meeting Muslims during the Kosovo conflict. But he insists he looked up the Yellow Pages and found the Gillies Plains Islamic Centre. You, you could call it impulsive, but I, I found them to be lovely people and they uh, actually had magazines like international news bulletins on all the topics and conflicts around the place. I was just happy to be with people that I felt it home with and, uh, you know, had answers to these political questions. So I said to him on that, on that actual day that I'd like to be a Muslim. I think he was looking for something. He was looking for direction. Yeah, David understood, um, I suppose, the basics of the culture on the praying, but I don't think he had the full understanding of the whole, uh, I suppose, box and dice. They're very accommodating and, and, and patient, and I just, it, it, was, it was good. I felt like I'd found my place, and there was some discipline to it with the five times prayer. So I, I enjoyed, I no longer felt lost, I felt like I belonged. Three months later, aged 24, and now known as Muhammad Dawood, David Hicks set out for Pakistan to immerse himself in Islamic culture. It was November 1999. Based at a missionary madrasa near Lahore, the new convert travelled to various parts of the country, encouraging others to attend a mosque and pray. He wrote to his family enthusiastically. My time in Pakistan so far has been unbelievable. I've learned so much. My best adventure yet. Action-packed. But what I'm doing now is of the most importance, a major obligation to Islam, knowledge. I placed myself in an environment where there were many uh, views, uh, some were uh, sort of extreme views. Uh, so I wish I had have done things uh, differently. It was in Abbottabad the two men in military uniforms introduced David Hicks to what would become his next political cause. They introduced themselves as uh, Lashkar Taiba, and they were involved in a freedom struggle in uh, Indian controlled parts of Kashmir. And it reminded me of Kosovo, 